Welcome back to Crushing Comics. I'm your host, Peter Marinari, and this is the show where I try to fall in love with my comic collection all over again as I unwrap them and reshelve them in my new home in Wellington, New Zealand. Let's dive right in. This, hmm, this is kind of thin, it's kind of light, so I think it's probably just going to be one omnibus on the slimmer side. Let's see. So it's interesting, Marvel's Omnibus line started um, started really as a fluke. They did a one-off Omnibus edition of the first 39 issues of Ultimate Spider-Man written by Brian Bendis as an exclusive for Barnes & Noble. And then maybe a year or two after that, released some Silver Age classic books like the original run of Stanley Jack Kirby Fantastic Four and Omnibus. But there was never this indication that there's going to be these hundreds and hundreds of Marvel omnibuses, and that we would have this expectation that every Silver Age series was going to get collected and every interesting modern run was going to get collected. This is a relatively modern phenomenon that's only emerged in the past decade. Even before 2008, as their frequency was increasing, they weren't produced as beautifully as they are now. They were still with glued binding before 2008. So this is really like a last 10-year phenomenon, um, which is still daunting if you're coming into it now as like a new collector and you're like, I want a big shelf of omnibus. I, I have a friend uh, who has all but like two or three of the omnibuses, but he's been working on it for several years. And if you were just coming in now, that would not be easy to do, because while some of the older ones have been reprinted, some of the ones that haven't been reprinted have become very, very scarce and draw, frankly, outrageous prices. So I wonder if this will be one of those, or who knows? Let's see. Ooh, it's in the wrapper. Oh, the best, really, really one of the best omnibuses and one of Marvel's original omnibuses. This is, not going to be in the wrapper for long, Uncanny X-Men, Volume 1. I'll start unwrapping it now. So I probably know the most about this omnibus uh, as any omnibus that's ever been printed because X-Men are my specialty. So X-Men started in 1963 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, ran for 66 issues, but then continued running in a sort of zombie version of X-Men that, uh, that was just reprints of the previous issues with new covers. And that continued up until Uncanny X-Men. Well, it wasn't Uncanny yet, actually. You'll notice this is giant size. And as we look on some of the covers on the inside, it didn't start... Actually, we can see them on the outside. It didn't start saying Uncanny for a while. And even when it did start saying Uncanny, um, it didn't officially become Uncanny in the Indicia until between issues 141 and 142. 140, 141? I don't know. Uh, so, what they did was bring X-Men back in a single giant-sized issue. Now, a lot of the comics at the time had giant-sized issues. They kind of functioned similar to an annual in that it just let them tell a big one-off story. Sometimes they were a wrapper of a slightly new framing sequence that was around like an older tale, but in this case it was all original and it had a really audacious approach that was really unusual for Marvel at the time. Maybe it was something DC did a little bit more. I really have no idea about anything related to DC ever really, because Marvel's my specialty. But it introduced a whole new X-Men team. Professor Xavier had to assemble this team because his X-Men had disappeared, only Cyclops had returned from the mission, and so Saver uh, puts on his Cerebro and travels around the world to find all of these gifted mutants, like Storm, like Colossus, like Nightcrawler. Uh, also some that you might not be as familiar with today, like uh, Thunderbird number one, and a very rarely seen mutant named Wolverine. Of course, Wolverine had already been created in Incredible Hulk, and he was adopted here, uh, one of the few characters that were adopted rather than wholly created anew. So it turned out that this was a moderate hit, and that it was time to bring Wolverine back, and or not Wolverine back, the X-Men back, well, and Wolverine too. And so it was originally being written by, I want to say Len Wein, right? Yeah, who had written the giant size issue. But shortly thereafter, he turns it over to a young writer who had just joined the Marvel stable, and that writer's name was Chris Claremont. So Chris Claremont takes over the X-Men and turns it into the epic that we know and love today. Chris Claremont um, actually writes 
from issue 94, Len Wein had a co-write with him on 94 and 95, so pretty much everything except for the giant size story itself is Claremont. And he originally starts immediately sowing in seeds that pay off later, seeds of Jean's emerging power and her romance with Cyclops, seeds, uh, seeds of Wolverine's curmudgeonness, uh, of Storm's sort of adjustment to the culture shock of being in America, although we learn later in uh, retcon stories that she had lived in the States as a young girl with her parents. And uh, this is full of classics. Now the interesting thing about this is it stops at issue 131, which is kind of sort of in the middle of the Dark Phoenix Saga, the beginning of the Dark Phoenix Saga. So it was the beginning of kind of like Jean's downfall and the team had begun to have their conflict with the White Queen and the Hellfire Club, um, but it's not the Dark Phoenix Saga issues that most people think about with uh, Wolverine breaking in through the basement of the Hellfire Club and then eventually the team fighting Jean and her going to space. They're all at the beginning of the next omnibus. It's a weird break point and I bet if Marvel had to do it all over again they would just slot in another six issues to this omnibus to finish it out. It's because the omnibuses were mirroring the breakup of the contents in the Marvel Masterworks editions and you can see that Uncanny X-Men Marvel Masterworks 4 ends with that White Queen issue, and so that's the way that Marvel was doing it. Now, most of their original Silver Age omnibuses were um, three Masterworks worth of content. Well, let's not say most. There were some that were four. But if you look at this first Masterworks, which was released a long, long time ago. This is a re-release. It was actually originally released um, in the late 80s or early 90s. It only has a few issues in it. It's just X-Men 94 to 100. So this is not, this is like the slimmest, I think the slimmest masterwork ever. So it makes sense that the it would have four and Marvel probably was balking at the idea that it could have five to go all the way to the end of Uncanny X-Men um, Masterworks number five, which goes all the way through 140, which actually would have been a really good stop point. But um, so it's kind of awkward. And for a long time, there was no annual two so, or no omnibus to rather so you were kind of stuck like you had been built up to the beginning of the phoenix saga and you had nowhere to go of course now there's um as we've already unwrapped there's number two and number three and we've gotten pretty deep into claremont's run now this is the third printing of this book so if you look at this cover it's not that leatherette kind of stuff we're used to, which sometimes can be called buckram, but it's also a fake leather. Uh, buckram, I think, is more of the fabric-y version. Um, it's just this matte, it's called a soft touch coating. You'll find it in a lot of books. It got really popular in the early 2010s, and it's um, known as soft touch, it, and it's said to have a rose petal finish in some instances. Like, it has this, like, very kind of, like, soft, velvety finish to it. So this is just printed right on the book. It's not a deboss stamp. And so they can also print color on the book. Now, if you look at newer omnibuses that have been printed with these methods, they will do a wrapped um, color cover underneath that's full art, which are really attractive. But on the Silver Age ones, they're staying with this kind of very plain look because the original ones had been debossed with like a silver or a gold stamp of some kind, and they're trying to match that format. This was originally printed relatively early in Marvel's omnibus line, and it had glued binding. Now, glued binding is not the end of the world, but it means each individual page, rather than been, being sewn into signatures to meet here, is glued down. And so kind of any one of them could come loose, and the book itself um, won't open as far. I'm just going to actually do some relaxing of this book as I talk, which is the right way to open a book. Um, the book can't necessarily open as far because there's no one page that's anchored anywhere radially different on the spine. They're all kind of anchored across the flat of the spine. So glued books in the center don't open as far generally, and the pages kind of get in their own way. Whereas we're going to see when I get to the middle of this book in a moment that this book opens right down to the guts. And if I can try to find, if you can look really closely there, you can see that each signature is sewn in like in a like um, an individual comic book. All a signature means is a group of paper that's been folded in half so that you can like put sewing or um, staples through the middle of it. So these sewn books are constructed of signatures, and if you get to the middle of the signature, which I'm trying to do here, you can actually see the thread that attaches it to the spine. Let me find one. 
Okay, I've actually found a signature, and it's on a great page, too. So here's some early Phoenix drama. And if you look really closely, right into the middle of this page, you can see actual thread, which is connecting this to its binding. So, so then when you open the book, the, um, the, the spine here rounds a little bit, and so it kind of like thrusts up the pages a little bit, and that's part of the reason that you can open these farther and they don't have the reason, the um, issues that glued ones have. So, even though the glued one was popular because, oh my gosh, it was Claremont X-Men, people were way, way more into the reprint that came out that was a sewn spine, but still was um, the old textured cover instead of this printed on art matte cover. And that one got so expensive, there were points on eBay that it was, pardon me, selling for upwards of $300. Uh, which is crazy to think about because it's it's just this omnibus book. Like if you wanted to, you could read them in so many other formats. They're in hardcover masterworks, paperwork masterworks, uh, essentials. Now they're an epic collection, but at the time it was the way that people wanted it, and it was um, it was oversized, and people really love the oversized art. Now, of course, there's this printing, and I think it's been back to press once or twice since then. Um, there's the indication that Marvel maybe is planning to keep this Claremont X-Men run evergreen, which would be awfully wise, because it's one of the most in-demand runs that they've got, and they actually went back to press on Volume 2 when Volume 3 came out, so if we ever get Volume 4, perhaps they will go to press on Volume 1, 2, and 3 again. Gosh, that's been an awful lot of stuff about books, and not an awful lot of stuff about the, com the content here, after I told you it was something I was so expert in. The great thing about this book is you get to see these new X-Men characters gelling with each other. And the first six issues are kind of like, oh, whatever. Claremont's getting a use for the, or getting used to the feel of them, and he's kind of shuffling some folks off, off stage that he doesn't really want to deal with. It really gets cooking after 100, not just because the X-Men crash to Earth and we get Gene um, first with the Phoenix, but there's a series of interesting issues there. The team has their first face-off with Magneto after they come back from their hiatus. We get the original introduction of the Shi'ar as the team struggles um, to save their civilization and with the McCran crystal. Uh, we get Wolverine being hunted by the Canadian government in a way that eventually turns into Alpha Flight, but then there's this really great run of issues in the... Um, one teens, where the team squares off against Magneto, and a great many of them are presumed to be dead, and this is a theme that we'll go back to several times in X-Men, but it splinters the team in an interesting way, just for a couple of issues, and it lets, um, it really mixes it up, and it leads to some really good stories, including the team in the Savage Land, where they're fighting against Sauron, and then eventually they make it back to the States, um, and they are then in, uh, they fight Arcade in Murder World, they go to Muir Island and have uh, their encounter with Proteus. So just a lot of really formative X-Men stories here where you really learn a lot about this new team of characters. And what's funny is that some of the things we take for granted with the characters haven't even happened yet, but we know them so innately that we're like implying them into our read, which is fine because Claremont retroactively made it like he intended it that way all along. A great example of that is Wolverine's healing factor. So somebody asked me once, when is the first issue that Wolverine has his healing factor? And I got out my Masterworks and I started paging through thinking, well, it's got to be relatively early. He's always getting the crap beat out of him. But they don't explicitly say it on panel for quite some time. They also, for a while, think his claws are part of his gloves. Uh, but we all know this as a modern reader, so we're projecting our modern reading thoughts onto the old Wolverine. We see him get beat up and we're like, oh, he's going to be fine because he's got his healing factor. But that was not only known not known to the readers of the time. It was not known to Chris Claremont yet, maybe, depending on how he and Cockrum and then he and Byrne uh, were developing the character. And that is the last thing to say about this run. I mean, I could probably talk about this run for a day and a half. The two artists, Dave Cockrum and John Byrne, are two of the best artists in the history of X-Men, if not in the history of, like, comic books. And uh, to have their art in oversized format here is just phenomenal. Cockrum, of course, was the artist who contributed all of the designs of the new X-Men as they showed up in giant size. So the design of characters like Storm and Nightcrawler were all his, and he was also a big part of the um, conceptualization of the characters as well, because he had notes on them. Burn, uh, to me, is like one of the most classic artists. He draws these very clean-lined characters 
that are just very classic and just kind of scream classic comic books to me. And his art translates very, very well into this remastered, oversized format, especially with really cleaned up colors. So highly, highly recommended. The only thing I would say against it is if you only know X-Men from like movies or TV, and you're like, I want to go back to the beginning, take me to the start, and you've never read a Silver Age comic before, all this is like late in the Silver Age, into the Bronze Age. Um, it is slow reading and is not modern. It's very narrated. People repeat things a lot because the comics were just meant to be picked up one at a time off the shelf and there's no guarantee that anybody had read the previous issue so it feels just like each issue is like halfway recapping things that happened already and not in like a handy recap page but just like through the characters being like remember when we did that thing? Oh that thing was hard. I agree. Yes my indomitable will and my invulnerability and all those Claremontisms which if you haven't read them yet you will get to know. So if you're coming into X-Men Fresh there's probably some other places that you could go to get started but if you are coming into X-Men and you know you like Silver Age comic books or you know you are not going to mind those sort of um, period writing, then this is a great place to start. And it's great value for the money because you are getting 40 issues of just absolutely classic comic books along the way. So I'm so happy that you could be here for me to unwrap this. And now I've got my whole Uncanny X-Men three volume set unwrapped, which is awesome. You will find that there's going to be a lot more X-Men in this series. It's actually kind of amazing that we haven't unwrapped more under X-Men than we have so far. So let's get it back in the dust jacket and have our ceremonial shelving. We have to move something else out of the way to get it onto this shelf here. Which is why this series is so important, because I have to unpack this damn room. Alright, tune in next time when we unwrap more books. They might be X-Men, or they might not be, but either way I'm going to learn to love them and tell you about why I bought them in the first place. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Crushing Comics.